other form elements other than text boxes. Last time we talked about validating text boxes and today we're going to talk about other form elements including validation and maybe even doing some other things with them. So what I'm going to do is I am just going to uh, make kind of a, um, a, a test page just from scratch and we'll put a bunch of different form controls on it and, and examine their behavior and create a validate function and so on and so forth. All right. Let's talk about what other form controls there are and let's talk about how we can validate them. All right. There's a text box. All right. So far we validated that there's something in there. <laughs> that there is uh, a number in there and that the number is within a certain range. And there's other things that we could validate as well. You know what's actually hard to validate? A date. You know why it's hard to validate a date? Because if you put in something like March 32nd, it rolls it over to April 1st. So it's kind of hard to validate a date correctly. All right, it's kind of weird. Um, at any rate, uh, you can validate. We, we've seen examples where you can validate for certain things for a text box. So text boxes, at least for now, were covered. Drop down. Can we validate a drop down? Do you need to? Okay. You're just selecting. Can a drop-down not have a value? Okay. Actually, a drop-down cannot have no value. <laughs> All right. A drop-down always has a value. This is one thing where HTML, and this is a little different than VB. I think in VB you can have a drop-down that doesn't have a value. But does that mean that we don't have to validate it? Because you're always going to have a value in the drop down then. If you can't not have a value, all right, I hope I'm not talking in circles. The value of the drop down could depend on the value of the drop down before it. Well, we're not, yeah, a lot of things, but we're not talking about that right now. Is there a reason to validate the selection of a drop down? Just a single drop down? Yeah. Normally what you do, again, given that a, a drop-down always has a value, um, oftentimes what you do is you put a dummy value on there. So, for example, um, yeah, pl please select residency status if you're calculating tuition. And it could be in county, out of county, out of state. Now, don't be lazy and say, you know what, I'm going to make in county the default, then I don't have to worry about validating. Make it a default if it makes sense for it to be a default. You know, what's the risk of making it a default? People are liable to select it without thinking about it and make the wrong choice. What's the, uh, what's the, what's the potential drawback of not having a default? Well, you know, you're forcing people to enter data when most of the people a certain value is going to be true. You have to make that judgment call on a design level. But what we'll talk about in this one is, in this example, we'll talk about how to validate it. So if it's the dummy value at the top, it, it gives an error message. All right. So that's how we validate a drop down. How can we validate a radio button? Can a radio button have no value? Yeah, radio button is different than a drop down in that regard in that a radio button can not have a value. If none of the items have been checked, then if none of those items have been checked, then it won't have a value. What if you default a radio button? What if I defaulted this radio button to um, in county? Pardon me? 
then there's a value, and it can never not have a value then, right? So if you give a default for it, then it can't, you can't like uncheck all of them, all right? You could start out initially with all of them unchecked, but once one is checked, then one of them will always stay checked. So you could default a radio button if you wanted to, and if you did, then you wouldn't need to validate it. All right, um, because once you've made a selection in a radio button, you can't unselect all the radio buttons. Yes. Is that okay to do? Well, again, if you're doing it because it, the question is, is it okay to do that? If if it legitimately makes sense to make that the default, yeah, then that's fine. If you're looking and saying, you know what, it's late at night, I don't feel like validating this, so I'm not going to. So I'm going to make one of them a default, just randomly pick one. Then no, that's probably not a good idea. So it's not really a technical issue, it's, it's a design issue of does it really make sense for there to be a default here. Checkbox. Can you validate a checkbox? What is the world's most popular checkbox? I, I agree to terms and conditions, right. So in a way you can't validate it. But you can force people to check it before they go on. So like I agree to the terms and conditions, um, blah, blah, blah. If it really is a yes or no question that they can truly answer yes or no, then no, you can't really validate it because it's either going to be checked or unchecked. But if it's one of those check boxes where the person is prohibited from going forward until they check it, then um, um, then, then you really, uh, the, the, then, you, then you can do a validation of a sort on it. Let's see. I think there's one other thing, and that would be a text area. Text area, we can validate very similar to a text box, but there's an additional little problem with the text area. And that is, how much data can you put in a text area? There really is no limit. All right. Now, when I define the text area, I specify the number of rows and columns. You might look and say, if I specify the number of rows and columns, then that text box can only contain 500 characters because there's 10 rows and 50 columns. All right, so I could only put 500 characters. That's not the case. The rows and columns is simply the display size of it. So I could put as much text as I wanted to in there. Now, I could validate it so that when the user clicks submit, it tells the user that they've exceeded the number of characters. All right, I could do that. But that's kind of mean in a way, right? I mean, Let's say you have a, a text area uh, for user comments, you know, and someone goes on and writes like, you know, a 10,000 word essay about the issue that they've had with your company, you know. And they go to hit submit and, and they get an error that says, sorry, you know, this field only accepts 128 characters, all right. It's kind of like the old joke, write your complaint here and there's an itty bitty little thing there. All right. Now, why would you first of all put any limit on the text box? Why would there be a limit on, on how much data you'd let someone enter in the text box? Or, I'm um, sorry, text area. Why would you constrain that to begin with? Why not let someone put? Pardon me? Sorry. Yeah, file size or if it's tied to a database. If it's tied to a database, the database may only accept a certain number of characters and therefore um, yeah, it would be like a Twitter message, exactly. So, the nicer thing to do would be to validate as they're entering in. And if they've exceeded the limit, then tell them, hey, you've exceeded the limit. All right? So that's what we're going to work on today, those different validations. We will validate a drop-down to make sure they haven't picked a dummy selection. We'll validate a radio button to... Um, make sure that they've picked an option. We'll validate a checkbox to make sure they've picked an option. And 
will validate text area as they type it in. Now we might do something fun, fun using my definition of the word fun as opposed to the one that's standardly used in the English language, all right? We might do something fun such as disable the button until they check that they agree with terms and conditions. I've seen sites that do that, and that's pretty good, right? You know, don't even let people click the button and get the air. Don't even let them click the button until they've gone and said, yes, I agree with the terms and conditions. So we'll try that as well. I'm a firm believer that to the degree that you can, it's good to validate stuff the instant that occurs, in some cases anyhow. All right, don't let people make an error as opposed to let them make the error and then yell at them. All right. Now that being said, you have to balance it. Sometimes, for example, like in, in your coin lab, you know, they may pick uh, the quantity before they pick the coin. As soon as they pick the quantity, you don't want to pop up an error message saying, hey, you haven't picked the coin yet. They haven't had a chance to pick the coin yet, right? So you have to kind of balance that with the usability. But from a technical perspective, we'll look at, at a few options. So let me just go in and let me make uh, a form. All right. I'll start out with this guy. And let's slowly add stuff to this. I'm going to get rid of, for now, I'm going to get rid of all the style and all the JavaScript and all that. Now, one thing to keep in mind with this, again, I'm going to be a little sloppy maybe on my coding here. All right. I'll try not to be too bad, but be a little sloppy on the coding here. One thing to keep in mind is a lot of times when students see me do something in class, they'll immediately um, like try to do the exact same thing. You have to take what I'm saying and apply it to the particular problem. All right. So I'm going to give examples on how to do something. You may not have to do exactly what I have to do for any of my assignments. But I know that's exactly what I did when I was a student. You know, at the end of the chapter, you're reading a math problem. You have no clue how to do it. What do you do? You flip through back through the pages. Oh, they multiplied here. I guess I better multiply. You know, they could have flunked me in math just by putting addition statements at the end of the chapter about multiplication, because I would assume you had to multiply in all the cases, right? And you know, so in this class, we want to encourage sort of the higher level thinking of take these examples as techniques how to do something but then figure out how you can apply them to the particular thing that you're working on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a form here. And this might not be 100% valid HTML, but we're not going to worry about that here. And it might not be 100% accessible. So if anyone runs into issues with that, let me know. All right, I'll do my best to, to do this. I'm going to start by validating a drop down. And I'll put in my select and I'll put in an ID of residency. Imagining that we're doing a drop down for uh, the residency statuses here at LC. And I will say the first option, the value equals an empty string. And I'll make the text that's going to display select residency status. I'll then paste three options in. Those of you who have taken or are taking the 243 course, maybe this example will give you an appreciation of how the, the .NET uh, validators do stuff for you. Because if they didn't, we'd have to do this ourselves like we're doing here. All 
I'll go up here and I'll put my validate function. Now, there's actually a couple ways I could validate this drop down. Probably the most straightforward way would be do like we've done consistently. Use the ID to point to this and then look at a particular attribute. All right? And the way we can do that is say if document get element by ID. residency dot value equal equal that then we have an error okay and what I'm going to do is I will go create down here a div just for my results And I'll say, I'll, every time I click the button, I'll clear out the results. So I'll say results.innerHTML equals nothing. If the value of it is nothing, then I'm going to go and I'm going to put in the inner HTML um, please select residency status. All right, let me make sure this works. Here we'll see our drop down in a second here. All right. I'll have to change the label on that. Notice again, the drop down always has a value. You can default the value by using the selected attribute on the option. If you don't, then it will have the value of the top item on the list. So in this case, since I didn't want to make a default, I put as a top item on the list select residency status. That's sort of a dummy value. And then the value of that dummy thing I made as an empty string. Another thing that people often do would be like make it something absurd, like a negative one or something, some value that, that none of the other options will possibly have a choice for. All right. And then one of the attributes I can say is I can say what is the value of that drop down. And that will give me the value of the option that's selected. There's other ways that we can get at the value as well. We can use the selected index and, and so on and so forth. All right? But value will give us the value of that drop down. So if we run this and don't make a selection, we get our error. If we do make a selection, we don't get our error. So really, the drop down is similar to a text box in the, in the fact that you're testing there, there's a value attribute and you're testing to make sure it is something other than whatever the dummy default item is. All right, so that's that one. Any questions? Now, the radio button The radio button and the checkbox, they have value attributes as well. But their value attribute doesn't mean the same thing as it does for a, um, for, for a drop down or for a text box. In other words, if I make a radio button in here, let's do the exact same thing except with radio buttons. 
So I'll say input type equals radio name equals rd res id equals in county value equals ic Please do not tell my 216 class this. I am going to use a break tag. This, this is just a description so the user knows what that radio button means. Because otherwise there'll be three blank radio buttons, right? So it's just some text to go before it. Yeah. Now, um, notice that with a radio button, for a radio button to work like a radio button, they all have to have the same name. All right? So. RDRES is the name of this radio button. If I did not do that, then it wouldn't work as a radio button. If I gave them each different names, then I'd be able to select all of them. All right? Um, I have to, if I give them IDs, IDs have to be unique. So if I give them IDs, I can, um, uh, they have to be unique. So the, the IDs are unique, but the names are the same. And the value will be the value if it's selected. All right? So, I'm going to put an alert in here. And I'm going to display the value of RD res. All right. So I'm going to just display in an alert box the value of, I'm sorry, not RD res, in county. All right. So I'm going to display the value of this radio button. Will it? Is it? We'll find out now, won't we? Is none of the above an option? So I go here, I hit validate, gives me IC. All right. Why do you give me IC? I didn't check anything. Well, let's look at it. It it was pretty literal about this. You said give me the value attribute of the thing with the ID in county. All right. And so what does it give me? It gives me the value of the thing called in county. All right? So a radio button has its value regardless if it's checked or not. So therefore, um, you can't ask what the value is of that radio button because it will always give it to you. What you have to do is you have to ask if the radio button is checked or not. All right? That's a different thing. All right? Now, how can we do this? We can do it. <laughs> we can do it the, the brute force way, or we can do it a more elegant way. Let's start with the brute force way, because the brute force way will be probably easier to visualize. Then we'll move on to the more, more elegant way. All right. So, let me go in up here, 
and I'm going to say it. I'm going to I'm going to create a variable that says RB selected, and I'm going to set it equal to nothing. If and I'm not going to test the value. I'm going to test to see if that radio button is checked. And if it's checked, then RB selected equals what? RB selected equals, well, I could do that. I could hard code IC or I could just as well say the dot value. All right. So, I'll then test the other two. And already, you know, some sirens should be going off in your head. Because this begs the question, what if there were 10 radio buttons? Would I have this code duplicated 10 times? You know, do not repeat yourself. This looks like the same code repeated over and over again, which it is. So I'm going to go and I'm going to add to that I'm going to add to that inner HTML the value of RB selected. So now I come into this form, I click validate, it tells me none selected. I select the first one, it tells me the value selected is IC, the second one OC, the third one OS. Okay? So we've determined which one is selected, sort of in a two part way. We find out which one is checked. And when we find the one that's checked, we grabbed the value. Now, the problem with this is if I added a fourth residency status, like out of the country or something like that, then I would have to change the radio button and the JavaScript. All right? There's a better way to do it. All right? And that will involve looping through, identifying how many radio buttons there are and looping through all of them. All right? This is going to involve using a different way to point to those radio buttons. All right. So far in this class, get element by ID has been um, a workhorse for us. You know, I don't think two minutes has gone by without me using get element by ID for something, because that's a very effective way to point to the one thing on the page that has a particular value. But sometimes we don't want to point to just one thing on the page. Sometimes we want to point to a list of things on the page. And there's other ways to, to uh, refer to that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and I'm going to create a second piece of code that looks at the same radio buttons but processes it a different way. And I'm going to type in this instruction and make it work first, make sure that it works first, and then, then we'll go in and explain it.
All right, I think this is right. We will see now, won't we? So essentially, I'm doing the same thing underneath it. All right, let's go and make sure this works. Yeah, let's close out of this. Click validate. I get none selected once, but not twice. Let's see, do I have an error? RD, not RB. Note to the video crew, can you edit out those last two? <laughs> there we go. All right, let's look at this code and see what it does. All right, I initialize my string as that there's none selected. I then am using a different way to refer to the radio buttons. Instead of saying document.getElementById, I'm saying on the document, in the document, there's a form called my form. All right. Contained in that form is a set of radio buttons that have the name, not the ID, but the name of RDRES. Okay. The name of RDRES. So, since there's a set of them, if I say document.myform.rdres, that doesn't return one radio button. That returns a list or an array of radio buttons. Right. Yeah, it, it does. It's a little less straightforward, but, but the coding is a lot, lot more straightforward. So, if I say start i off at zero, it's going to look at the zero through the first radio button, the second, the third, and so on. I'm going to do that as long as i is less than the length of that array. What's the length of that array? How many elements are in it? So uh, in this case there's three radio buttons, right? So um, i is going to be, or the length is going to be three, so i will have a value of zero, one, and two. So it will look at the zeroth radio button, see if it's checked. If it's checked, grab the value. Look at radio button one. If it's checked, grab the value. Look at radio button two. If it's checked, grab the value. And if none of them are checked, then it still has that default value. So both of them work in sync. And this one has the advantage of, if I were to add uh, another option here, I don't have to touch that code. So if I were to add an international, I didn't want to do that here. Exactly. So if I wanted to add a international option here, I could do that. And the top code is going to break, the second piece of code is going to work. So if I pick international, because the first set of code was hard-coded to look at out of county or in county, out of county, out of state, 
and there was no coding in there for international, it doesn't recognize that. The other one, since it actually looks to see how many elements are in that, how many radio buttons there are with that name, it loops through all of them and it will find the value no matter what. So that second way is probably a preferred way to do it. All right? But it involves a different way of pointing to the element on the screen. But that's fine, right? I could give, um, you know, I, I, could, I could say uh, where Lorraine Community College is based on uh, its address, right? That's one way to point to this location, 1005 Abbey Road, all right? I could also give the latitude and longitude, right? And that would also point to where this location is. So it's simply two ways to point to different things on the, on the page, to point to things on the page. And as such, again, um, you know, you use the one to your advantage. This one, again, has the advantage that when you use this syntax, you're liable to pick up an array of things. So if you're processing lists, that's probably a better way to do it than to um, um, access each individual ID. All right. Next, the checkbox. All right. The checkbox, we could validate about the same way. We could have our validate function that says if checkbox is checked, then this, otherwise do that. But we're going to do something a little bit different with the checkbox. We're going to disable the button until they've checked I agree. So how do you disable a button? I looked this up earlier this afternoon. And I'm going to pretend that I forgot so I can look it up again. Oh, come on, that was a little funny, right? I pretended like I forgot. Disabled equals disabled. Okay. So I can say on this button, disabled equals disabled. All right. So now that button is disabled. Can't click on it. Nothing happens. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put on that form a checkbox. I agree to the 5,000 page terms and conditions without reading a word. And we'll say input type equals checkbox. I could refer to this either way, right? I could give it a name and use the syntax document, my form, name of the checkbox. Or I could give it an ID and say document get element by ID. Both are going to point to the same checkbox. So just because we've done get element by ID so often, I'm going to use the other syntax and I'll give this a name equals um, agree. Okay, it's not, valid, it's not enabling that though. What do we have to do to enable it? Well, we got to run some JavaScript, right? JavaScript is how we change the properties of stuff on our page. What event do we want to have that's going to make this guy fire off and enable it? Pardon me? Uh, yeah, say there's not an unchecked event, there is an unclicked event. So what I can do is I can say unclicked, unclick equals um, see if agree. Whereas see if agree will be a 
function up here. And I can say, if, how am I going to refer to that using the name and not the ID? Document, name of the form, my form, the name of the name, or the value of the name, which is agree, dot checked, then I want to point to that button and enable it. Well, I need to give that button either a name or an ID. Just for giggles, I'll give it an ID. Call it BTN Val. Yeah. Equals enabled, I am guessing. Otherwise, I want to set it to disabled. So if they get someone tricky that, that disabled it and then changes their mind, or, or that enables it, then changes their mind and, and unagrees, then it'll set it back. So let's see if this works. Yep. Getting an error, or, or I'm not getting an error. Make sure I saved it. Well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to put an alert in here. Make sure I'm getting in that function, right? Ah, looks like it should be true or false. Ah, there we go. Yay. All right. Our last thing is to, and we, uh, we, we have it, sure. You've always wondered how Twitter does the countdown of how many characters you have left. Admit it. You want to know. All right. So let's go and let's put a text area here. All right. That we can test the value for. And we can truncate it. So I'm going to say text area. Um, ID equals uh, tweet. And I'm going to put next to that text area a span. 
with an ID of character count. And we'll start out with it being 140. All right. What do you suppose the event we want to have is? When do we want to count the characters? When they press a key. Actually, not when they press a key, but when they release a key. So on key up, I'm going to go and I'm going to check length. All right. Yep, check length. Oh, should be on this. I'll make my function of check length. And I will say that document get element by ID. Character count. Inner HTML. <coughs> equals 140 minus tweet that length. And let's see if this works. Ooh, N-A-N. Because I don't think length is the right property. Ah, that value, that length. And it counts it down. Yay. How do we stop at 144 characters? Well, we can do something like this. If it's greater than 140, then The Java left function? Is there a JavaScript thing? JavaScript left function? No, there isn't. But there is a JavaScript substring function which says, give me from and to 0 to 139.
Ouais. The spice function would do that, but as we go down, as we hit the 140 mark, anything I type in sort of gets replaced. So if I type in Mike, it goes away. Actually, it should go to 140. Yeah, it cuts off the extra characters that I've typed in, which is exactly what I would want it to do. Let's make this 200 so we can see it all on one line. As I type it, it truncates it to 140. Can I do one more thing? Can't you tell I'm having a good time? I want to do one more thing. What if we warn people if they try to click on the button and they haven't enabled it yet? All right. How do we do that? Can I say on mouse over this button? I don't think that's going to work if it's disabled, all right? So if I say on mouse over equals, let's just alert something, alert high. disabled so it doesn't pop up. So what can we do? Well, we can be clever and we can wrap this guy in a span. Still, absolutely nothing happens. Tell you what, I will work on this one. What I want to do is, I want to display a warning if they try to click on the button and it hasn't been enabled yet. But, you know, how do you do that if the button is disabled? So let me ponder on that one. I thought I could do it just by put, wrapping a span around it, but oh well. I'll, I'll have an answer for this and I'll post it when I have it. Now, here's the point of this, all right? The point of this is we did a, a, a sort of a wild range of things, all right? And even especially when we get this, this button popping up a warning message, we'll do even more stuff. That it all follows a formula, though. Knowing what event is going to get the ball rolling, all right, on key up, when I finish typing, when I click on something, when I put my mouse on something. I need to know the event. I need to be able to point to the things on the page. And we now have two methods to point to the things on the page, either document get element by ID or uh, document name of the form, name of the field, all right? And then it's a matter of writing the JavaScript code to manipulate those attributes to get what we want. All right? And really, that's what client side scripting is about. You know, you need to see it in that perspective. And I know it can be dawning, but identify the event that you want to do, probably as a starting point. What attributes do you want to access, and what attributes do you want to change? You know, in your example. Uh, or in your assignment. You want to grab the value from a dropdown. Well, how do you grab the value from a dropdown? Well, we saw in this example and in earlier examples how to do that. 
You also need to grab the value from a radio button. How do you grab the value from a radio button? Again, we saw how to do that. All right? And then it's a matter of putting the things together and, and writing the code to finally accomplish what, what you want to do. All right. Um, that's all I had here. I owe you an answer on the other one, and we'll make it over in lab, and we'll go from there.